Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special event, um, which uh, you've got the title for. Uh, I am uh, Dina Matar. I teach at uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, and I'm also a visiting fellow at the LSE Middle East Center. I'm delighted to be chairing this event, uh, particularly at a very topical and important time for the Middle East, but I leave uh, Carl to speak about it. Um, uh, Carl will be speaking for about 40 to 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have questions and answers uh, from the floor. I think important, can you all silence your phones? Because this is a recorded uh, event, and we do not want, and it's kind of very uh, annoying for the speaker to hear um, the peep coming on. Um, we welcome Carl. He is, Carl Shallow is an architect, commentator, and an extremely according to him, bad cartoonist, <laughs> <laughs> who is best known for brilliantly satirizing Middle East politics on Twitter. He I is didn't write that one. <laughs> I didn't write that introduction. <laughs> oh, no. I, th I think he can, he can talk about himself much more uh, eloquently than myself. He is director at PLP Architecture in London and co-author of Manifesto Towards a New, New Humanism in Architecture, which was included in 100 Artists' Manifestos from the Futurists to the Stuckists. St oh, I have to explain what that means. <laughs> which is a survey of 100 influential art, man art manifestos from the last 100 years. He has practiced architecture in London and Beirut and taught for five years at the American University of Beirut. We really welcome you here and thank you for giving us your time. Um, <laughs> I still have to uh, say a few things. If you want to tweet about the event, the hashtag is uh, at um, LSE Remarks, and uh, then uh, you can you can you can tweet as much as you want, and um, hopefully you will, uh, because I think we're going to hear some uh, exciting uh, stuff from Carl. So without further ado, Carl, can you? Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I hope this lives up to your expectations. Um, I, I went to the LSE about 15 years ago, and I had a joke prepared for an opener because um, I'm getting old and senile, and I thought this was the room that I took my uh, final exam at the LSE in, and I was going to say, I hope tonight goes better. <laughs> <laughs> Still works. I've, I've, I've rescued that joke. So, um, as Dina said in the introduction, and many people ask me, um, why, why do you say that you're an extremely bad cartoonist? <laughs> I wanted to warm up with this uh, kind of on a lighter note. It's uh, where my, um, a lot of people assume that I look like him, um, the, the character, my Twitter character. Uh, where that figure came from, and it's from this series of cartoons that I did in 2013 uh, about the Phoenicians, um, the mythical original inhabitants of, uh, semi-mythical original inhabitants of <laughs> Lebanon. And um, um, can you read, by the way, or do you want me to read it out for you? Okay. Um, so by the way, I have to tell you, these characters are called Abdushmoon and Hano. They're authentic Phoenician names. But people always ask me, which one is your character, Abdishmoon or Hano? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, let's read it. So wh what's this, Hano? It's a new god, Melkart. But we have Baal. He's our only god. Yeah, the more the merrier. I guess there's no harm. I might make one as well. They can all coexist. This can't go wrong. And the title was, as you can see, the Phoenicians invent polytheism. <laughs> this one... Um, <laughs> okay. And, and because of uh, the superb technical skills at my disposal, I moved into animating those. That I, I wanted to share this one with you today. Is that 
Kaan Alex Suurun Säkkärin maapäivän Shady Tarot mainittu pyrstävästä aksista. Mainittu Shady Tarot Säkkärin maapäivän Shady Tarot oli Skandarin mainittu. I, I, I thought that's considering everything that's been happening this weekend, that's, uh, that was going to be quite, quite topical, quite relevant. Uh, on, on a similar note, uh, by, by the way, can I just ask by a show of hands, how many people here uh, speak or understand Arabic? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's brilliant. Shall we just switch to Arabic? <laughs> okay, and again, back to my kind of early beginnings with um, bad cartoons was this that I thought um, I'd share again today. Um, by the way, I'm going to dazzle you today with the PowerPoint special effects. And this was kind of summarized the experience of being Lebanese to me, Lebanese politics, the board game. <laughs> and I particularly, I want to draw your attention to... <laughs> well, when I did it, I didn't imagine that we'd be as fraught with danger as it is today, I mean. I was thinking before this event, I'm going to have to talk, I'm going to have to make the, co the, the talk all about, you know, the West because Lebanon is starting to seem a um, normal <laughs> country. <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> anyway, I want to start with how I got into satire with a little bit of context. You know, I want to set the scene. And this is going back a few years, you know, of 2011 on. Is the Arab world ready for democracy? Why Western democracy can never work in the Middle East? Why Arab democracy will fail? It was kind of the sense that we were getting at the time. And then, you know, articles started getting esoteric. And this is what really got me into this whole notion of satire, because uh, I started off writing serious um, articles and analysis. And then I realized, you know, the, the, the kind of the kind of language which is used to describe and talk and analyze the Middle East is, um, um, is, is kind of laden with, with stuff that you don't encounter when you're talking, for example, about the West. And um, <laughs> 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 so, some punchlines write themselves. <laughs> Better still. <laughs> And, and, and then to me, you know, and, and this is a particular favorite for me. I, I, I don't see, no, if you can see this line over here. There's a fox in Tahrir Square, bushy-tailed and thickly furred. <laughs> he claims to hear everything. This is by someone who I, I, I really respect, and he wrote about the Middle East for a long time, Robert Fisk. Um, but I think with, with in those past few years, there's again uh, creeped in the kind of, that kind of language of writing a bit about the Middle East that I, one of my first pieces uh, was satirizing that, and I would like to share that with you tonight. And um, he <laughs> was, <laughs> and it was uh, reporting from Syria with sensational quotes in the headlines. This is an imaginary article from this series by Robert Fisk and the Independent and um, where our writer reports from the frontiers of his fertile imagination <laughs> with superb attention to detail and amusing historical facts. As I got in the car, a 1962 Mercedes built in the same factory where my father had once fought the German army in 1917, the driver smiled and nodded wisely. As all taxi drivers in the Middle East do when they're driving a foreign journalist around. <laughs> Ahead lay a deceptively empty stretch of road that my imagination quickly filled with the mental image of Sargon II's soldiers marching along, primarily to illustrate my excellent knowledge of history. <laughs> the man back at the hotel had warned me about the false tranquility of this part of Aleppo that I was about to visit. 
He only identified himself as the raven. <laughs> but something told me that I must trust this man dressed strangely in a abaya made of black feathers despite the searing heat. <laughs> I have stopped long ago questioning those mysterious men I encounter while reporting. And so too have my editors. <laughs> the raven sipped his black tea, sweetened with spoonfuls of the local cane sugar that was first processed when the Persians ruled this part of the Fertile Crescent. <laughs> then looked at me with his piercing eyes that looked more menacing above his long beak. Ask for Abu Muhammad. He will talk to you. He said Muhammad, but I have this habit of misspelling Arab names. <laughs> when I left, the raven had disappeared. If it weren't for the black feather on the floor, I would have thought that he was a mirage. Back on the road, the driver slowed, then took a turn between two huge rocks that resembled a lion about to brush its teeth. As he sped past, I glimpsed a seven-year-old child in a green and white t-shirt being hurried along by his worried mother and her brother-in-law's cousin who had recently come back from Canada. <laughs> Troubling times. Inexplicably, in this paragraph, I am suddenly transported to a room that the army is using as a temporary operations room. On the wall, above a wedding portrait of the previous occupiers, who now run a falafel shop in Brighton, <laughs> and a large map of the city. The commander, a 35-year-old major from Tartus who liked fishing in his spare time, described to me what they were doing there. I quickly lost interest as I was more interested in dramatic anecdotes. <laughs> also, he was speaking to me in Russian, which I didn't understand. <laughs> the soldiers outside talked to me more openly. They had interrupted the football game they were playing with empty B-67 ammunition bags. The goal was a makeshift target between two T-72 tanks, which for some reason I must mention in all my articles. One told me about the giant leaping Shechem fighters that he had come across only three days ago, but I sternly told him that it's my job to make things up, not his. <laughs> Instead, I asked him to tell me about his fiance and his plans to open an internet cafe when the war was over. When I finally made it to Abu Muhammad's hideout that afternoon, the sun was hanging low in the sky, its golden disk reminiscent of the famous necklace that the Emperor Aurelian had presented to Zenobia, the Queen of Palmyra, <laughs> before taking her in chains to Rome. I hope Saad Hariri got a pendant. <laughs> Have we not learned anything from the Middle East? Abu Muhammad gave me a different story to the one that Major Simba I know, I'm the only one who meets people with such names in the Middle East. <laughs> to the one Major Simba had narrated, something about the need for political change, but my mind drifted as I observed the partially collapsed gateway that had stood intact for 743 years. The stones of Syria can tell its stories better than most men. Later, as Abu Muhammad bid me farewell, I asked about the raven. He looked alarmed as he told me, that the raven died six months ago. <laughs> As usual, I will end with a completely irrelevant question that has nothing to do with the rest of the article and that leaves you even more baffled. Could it be that the current conflict is the logical outcome of Alembi's reluctance to engage the local chieftains? <laughs> Did King Faisal make a fatal mistake in the summer of 1932? What is really the point of those open-ended questions? <laughs> Could they be a useful way to imply that I'm a world-weary and have seen too much? Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I'm just gonna let these speak for themselves. No, but... Um, <laughs> So from there on, you know, I got really interested in this notion of uh, Western punditry about uh, the Middle East you know, and all the assumptions behind it and um, 
By the way, I know there are quite a few Western pundits in the audience tonight. Don't worry. I'm not talking about you. But, but I want to read this, this little bit of one of my other pieces, which is um, to show my gratitude to you know, the great Western journalists <laughs> that do a lot of interesting work in the Middle East. I, I had to write this, is, which is like more of a love letter, really. <laughs> it's an adoring profile of a Western journalist. The room lights up as soon as he walks in. <laughs> He's dressed in one of those khaki trousers that have many pockets. They're brimming with biscuits that he gently distributes to little brown kids <laughs> when he's on one of his expeditions. You don't get to be an accomplished Western journalist without understanding the way to the hearts of the natives, after all. <laughs> what makes a Western journalist so special? It's more than just a passport and a fortunate place of birth. The Western journalist embodies the voice of authority like no other kind of journalist can ever do. The Western journalist is compassionate, sensitive, knowledgeable, and above all, Western. <laughs> the Western journalist is a saber of truth, shining light onto the dark places we don't understand. And yet, there have been very few adoring profiles of the Western journalist and the role he or she plays in quenching our thirst for compassionate journalism and the fuzzy glow of enlightened inquiry particularly of the daring Western journalist who's not afraid or reluctant to make him or herself the center of attention <laughs> in whatever they are reporting on. Stories only acquire meaning when they are reflected through the prism of the complex personality of the Western journalist. <laughs> Can I just say, as I'm reading now, I'm spotting how many typos and things need <laughs> editing over there. I'm, I'm not quite sure if you know my... Um, you know, my uh, writing rituals where I, I, I had to write everything during my lunch breaks. That's a very good excuse for being so shoddy editing-wise. Anyway, so um, I just wanted to tantalize you with this, but please go back to my blog and read it because nobody's reading it anymore. <laughs> uh, from punditry, I think the other thing that started to intrigue me is this uh, notion of Middle East uh, geographies, um, you know, and... Um, Again, for context, a few years back, we started getting hit by a barrage of headlines proposing to redecorate the Middle East, partitioning Syria, partitioning Iraq, coming up with new countries. And um, I started kind of trying... <laughs> <laughs> I started kind of trying... <laughs> I started kind of trying to go back to the roots of this te Western tendency, you know, to rearrange the Middle East. And, and in one moment, I still don't have this idea. What if sykes Pico one night had gone out for pizza? What would they have done? And um, from then on, what I realized is um, sometimes I end up like writing satirical or doing satirical pieces preemptively. So this article, for example, came up. Um, I hope the writer isn't in the room or any of their friends. Uh, came out in the New York Times last weekend, and it's uh, how five countries could become 14 in the Middle East. And uh, I'm just going to kind of draw your attention to the highly realistic country names that will emerge. <laughs> Wahhabistan. <laughs> Shiaistan. <laughs> Sunnistan. <laughs> you can work out the rest. And um, by coincidence, I had a few years ago, <laughs> I started to predict how, you know, Western pundits will, will kind of think about um, the Middle East and the Levant in particular. And I did this kind of the fashionable alternatives to Sykes-Picot. Because, you know, if the way that Western pundits think of the Middle East, it has to be like Sunnis and Shias and Alawis and Maronites and... Uh, and I thought, you know, what if we like took all of this region and then we, we did them in a stripy, horizontal pattern? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a vertical one, <laughs> which is more slimming. <laughs> <laughs> I, and then I started to get creative, and <laughs> this one is my favorite. <laughs> and, 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 and I actually did prefigure, you know, this uh, kind of uh, notion of Wahhabistan and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
I, I don't need to comment on this. And um, again, with this, you know, this kind of logic of how do we, do we observe the Middle East, it kind of there's this intensity of uh, only seeing the Middle East through a sectarian prism, you know? So there, there are no states, there are no nations, there is just like uh, Sunnis, uh, Shia, Sunni houses, Shia houses, Sunni sofas, Shia sofas. <laughs> It's, it's, it got quite absurd, you know, how this perception of uh, the, the Middle East got. So in one of my pieces, I was like, um, we keep getting hammered by this idea that the Middle East is tribal. But if you actually thought about it, those tribes in the Western imagination have to be the sects. So I wrote at the time, again, another piece, which is ever so simple, a tribal map of the Middle East. That again, I'm going to read a few bits of, of it for you, uh, kind of trying to engage with that and spoof it. The Sunnis. The Sunnis are the largest tribe in the Middle East, primarily, primarily because there are so many of them. <laughs> they are described as the sleeping giant of the Middle East, although sometimes they are more of a crouching giant or a giant that is about to stand up. Many of the old dynasties of the Middle East were Sunnis, such as the Umayyads, the Mamluks, and the Ottomans, who were very good at making furniture. <laughs> this explains the sense of entitlement that Sunnis have <laughs> as they tend to walk around strutting like they own the place. <laughs> Due to their vast wealth, they do actually own the place. <laughs> in addition to other valuable assets in Europe and America, the leaders of the Sunnis are divided into two, oil sheikhs and religious sheikhs but the two should not be confused. There is increasing speculation that the real leader is one Azmi Bshara, <laughs> who is not himself a Sunni, but is highly respected due to his luxuriant mustache, a highly valued feature in Arab culture. <laughs> Some argue that he's a wizard who puts, put a spell on Sunni leaders, but there is little evidence to support this theory. The Shiites. A long, long time ago, something bad happened to the Shiites. And dear Lord, do they like to go on about it. <laughs> See also the Jews. <laughs> if I get arrested for this joke, at least I got a joke. <laughs> I got a laugh for it. This tendency to dwell on the past has come in handy, though, as the Shiites underwent a significant revival in the past few decades. Their warriors have acquired a mythical status, and dear Lord, do they like to go on about that? <laughs> the Shiites are the second largest tribe in the Middle East, and their leaders tend to be almost exclusively drawn from the ranks of the clergy. The leaders are divided into two types, regular and supreme. This novel approach to leadership can lead to occasional misunderstanding, and calling someone supreme leader can get to their head. <laughs> the Shiites' avowed enemy is the great Satan, but this is just a nickname for a major empire and should not be confused with the regular Satan. <laughs> for reasons that nobody quite understands, the great Satan handed the Shiites control over Iraq despite this deep animosity. The last one, the Christians. The Christians are divided into a number of smaller tribes, such as the Copts, who claim to be the original inhabitants of Egypt, the Assyrians, who claim to be the original inhabitants of Iraq, the Syriacs, who claim to be the original inhabitants of Syria, and the Maronites, who claim to be the original inhabitants of the universe. <laughs> I'll stop at that. Right. <clears throat> This kind of engagement, my engagement, you know, with the conceptions of um, uh, how the, the Middle East is represented in the contemporary Western imagination, led me to kind of get more into uh, this field of uh, explainers. And... Um, <laughs> well done for you, because you all speak Arabic. <laughs> and... Um, 
I was kind of amused, you know, there's a certain level of naivety about the Middle East, aside from the notion that everything there is sects and all of that. There's this pretension that you can, you know, the Middle East is simple to explain if you can just find the right pipeline diagram. <laughs> I'm going to skip this, but you can see it on YouTube because I think we're running a little bit behind time. And I wanted to talk a little bit about... Uh, I'm, by the way, I'm not going to analyze this a lot, but uh, <laughs> this weekend, I've, I've had to redraw all of this, by the way, after <laughs> what has happened. <laughs> I think we can discuss more of this in the questions and answers period, but uh, I think there was a lot of confusion why I did this, and a lot of people thought that I was trying to say that the Middle East is too difficult to understand, but in reality, I was um, kind of taking shots at the, the, the kind of um, confusion behind some of the actions of external actors in the Middle East who tend to kind of take uh, different sides almost um, as represented by this ancient Arab proverb. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and with that explainer was the beginning of uh, the, the now world famous institute of internet diagrams which you can check its work which is available online in, including its correlation um, between bad governance and, and good food. <laughs> um, I'm just going to draw your attention to Egypt. <laughs> uh, right. <clears throat> so a few years into my kind of satirical career, um, uh, you know, ISIS became a real, a real issue and a, and a real phenomenon. And uh, again, reflecting on how Western conceptions of ISIS worked at the time, I realized that this, and don't get me wrong, I really admire kind of uh, Western thinking and uh, analytical mode, and I was really trying to learn from it. So I realized that this tendency that Western people do, which is everything has to have one cause only. And <laughs> the shorter, the better. So, for example, if you're trying to explain the rise of ISIS, you can't have, like, two reasons. It has to be, like, climate change or inequality or whatever your pet cause is, you know? And um, I was like, I'm going, I'm going to uh, try to do that myself. So I want to try ISIS in one simple sentence. Um, my timing is really crap. I'm sorry. A simple one-sentence explanation for what caused ISIS Heroes. The failure of post-colonial elites to establish genuine democratic societies and foster a sense of national unity, opting instead for military dictatorships that eroded the potential for economic and political growth, coupled with the historic mistakes of Arab Progressive Party and their adherence to work of the traffic rulers, contributing to the complete evisceration of conservative political <laughs> frameworks that could create organic resistance towards external meddling, hegemony, and outright military intervention, leaving <laughs> rather religion as the only remaining ideological platform capable of mobilizing the disenfranchised, exacerbated by a global decline of universal ideals and the rise of identity as the prime mobilizer, and enabled by military and financial support from theocratic regimes aiming to shore up their legitimacy and made worse by the collapse of the regional security order, creating the conditions for proxy wars and political, social, and economic upheaval, intensified by <laughs> interference, international meddling, escalating conflicts, and leading to a perpetual state of chaos, under which the appeal of a revivalist religious political order embodied by the caliphate becomes attractive, particularly when coupled with a millenarian alternative narrative. Um, before I move on onto how I applied my, uh, you know, experience from Western analyst within the Western contest, I just wanted to close with a little Arab Spring postscript because that's where the career started. <laughs> And um, I had actually 
written um, this kind of, this is back in 2014. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of write like this postscript because what I think was a moment that was squandered, but as well to try to capture a lot of the, the analysis was uh, that they described it. So I, I want to write, a, I want to read a little bit of it uh, for you. Um, 11 days after Ben Ali's departure, a revolution started in Egypt demanding President Hosni Mubarak step down. The revolution was started by Egyptian secularists, which is an acronym made up of the names of the groups participating in the revolution, <laughs> such as the 6th of April movement, the 11th of April movement, <laughs> the 10th of April movement, and so on. As the days passed, the Egyptian army was torn between its loyalty to Mubarak and the Egyptian desire to break Tunisia's record of 28 days for a dictator stepping down. So the army stepped in and forced Mubarak to step down after 18 days, thus ensuring Egypt's names in the record books. <laughs> Mubarak was given the choice between prison and exile in Saudi Arabia. So he chose prison. <laughs> Most historians agree that what happened next was quite complicated to get into. And it is generally agreed that it's best to skip a few paragraphs to the election of Field Marshal and most manly man, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, to president of <laughs> Egypt in 2014, where he stayed in power until 2032, <laughs> or forever, whichever comes first. <laughs> it was Libya's turn next, according to an ancient Arab system that is based on observing the movement of the stars for a while and then realizing the futility of that and deciding to revolt. The Libyan people decided to topple Gaddafi, but Gaddafi said he wasn't actually the leader and reminded everyone of that episode in Seinfeld when Kramer couldn't be fired from his job because he wasn't actually employed by the corporation. <laughs> At this point, the world held its breath because this was the first Arab revolt not directed against a Western-friendly regime. Particularly if we ignore Tony Blair's groveling to Gaddafi and the CIA making use of his state-of-the-art torture facilities. I mean Gaddafi's torture facilities, not Tony Blair's, <laughs> because Blair preferred to rent facilities when he needed them, in keeping with his third-way political philosophy, which highlighted the importance of public-private partnerships. <laughs> After observing the situation for a few months, the West leapt into action and decided that it would be convenient to abandon Gaddafi and try to look like the good guys. Gaddafi was given the choice between exile in Saudi Arabia and death. <laughs> so he chose death. <laughs> Nobody knows exactly what happened next in Libya, but maybe if you're reading this in the future, you could tell us. Okay. And I wanna close with this um, James Bond film that I did. And again, I don't wanna dazzle you too much by my <laughs> technical skills.
So <laughs> I have been, can you hear me? I have, oh. <laughs> I have been living in the West for 15 years now. And um, you know, I approached it as an anthropological exercise. And um, I must say I blended in with the natives quite well. And <laughs> as you can see, I started dressing like them. <laughs> And that's where it was the start of the WENA studies program that I've <laughs> developed. And uh, <laughs> and I'm loving this, it's like silent stand-up comedy. <laughs> but it was all really those reflections on this kind of uh, tight bond between the Middle East and, uh, and, and the West. And uh, it's, it's really based on thousands of years of cultural exchange. <laughs> Let's do that again. <laughs> so, um, you know, and it kind of created this device for me to kind of look at all events through the prism of uh, this Occidentalist uh, uh, viewpoint. And um, I noticed, because I was trying to learn from the Western experts, you know, again, this kind of theme of when you look at the Middle East, um, there's this recurring thing that things have to happen because ancient hatreds and um, ancient hatreds and... Uh, Sunnis versus Shias and ancient hatred. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read that one, but uh, you're welcome again to go to my blog and read it because nobody's reading it anymore. <laughs> and it's your fault that I stopped writing. <laughs> but I thought it was a great vehicle, you know. Again, it's, it's, it's this. Um, um, the kind of the Western approach to news in the Middle East gave me a great vehicle to understanding how re events um, uh, that are happening in the West. So, for example, when the conflict started in Ukraine between Russia and the West, and it's escalating now, nobody thought to look at the division between Orthodox and Catholics. That obviously is the 1,500-year-old schism behind all these tensions that we see today in in, in Europe and. Um, from there on, again, I developed the same, <laughs> the same analytical rigor, this methodology of trying to understand events in the West. And again, I don't mean this flippantly, you know. It's a great vehicle for understanding events over here and putting them in their proper historic context, such as the roots of the Catholic-Protestant uh, conflict in Scotland. And then finally, when it comes to uh, Brexit, and I think I have a little bit of time to read this bit for you, in fact, trying to understand attitudes to the EU referendum through the prism of class is misleading. As most commentators here would tell you, class has nothing to do with it. And in fact, class has never played an important role in British politics or society historically. <laughs> most people don't even know which class they're in. And many can be members of the higher and lower classes simultaneously, such as Lord Alan Sugar, the world famous working class millionaire. <laughs> this fluidity in class identity, however, contrasts sharply with the fierce ethnic rivalry within the ancient kingdom. The Norman conquest of England in the 11th century left deep scars and created divisions between the Norman invaders and the local Anglo-Saxon population that continues to this day. The persistence of legends like Robin Hood and Ivanhoe describing native Anglo-Saxon resistance to the Normans attests to this fact. When Anglo-Saxons in Britain today look at the EU, they don't see a modern political union, but the lingering face of Norman occupation. <laughs> the persistence of this ancient Norman Anglo-Saxon rivalry in modern day Britain manifests itself more fiercely today, most fiercely today in the realm of soccer ball which is a local sport played on grass fields. <laughs> the local championship is followed by millions of zealous fans who support their teams religiously. It's dominated by Anglo-Saxon teams like Manchester United, Liverpool, and Newcastle, 
and Norman clubs like Chelsea, Tottenham, Spurs, and above all, Arsenal. <laughs> Arsenal has won many trophies over the years, but nothing really important over the last decade or so. The club, however, continues to be universally loathed by Anglo-Saxon fans, not least because of its long-time French, French is the modern word for Norman, <laughs> French manager Anselm Wenger, and the large number of French players who have played for the club over the years. It's also hated for its slick, irritating style of football, which betrays a quintessentially normal form of nihilism. <laughs> this style contrasts with the more muscular and intense Anglo-Saxon approach to the game, which shuns all aesthetic considerations. Unsurprisingly, Wenger is a, Wenger is a vocal, vocal supporter of the Remain campaign and Britain's continuing membership of the EU. In fact, many of the leaders of the Remain camp are of Norman origin while most of the leaders of the Leave campaign are Anglo-Saxon. The notable exception is Nigel Farage, <laughs> a politician of Norman extraction who argues that Normans and Anglo-Saxons should put their differences aside and focus on antagonizing foreigners instead. <laughs> Farage has been shunned by the Norman community for this public betrayal, but he has managed to build support among Anglo-Saxons, although not enough to get elected into parliament. Again, you can read that on the blog, the rest of it. Um, and then, you know, I started moving away from politics. I just think this beautiful pieces and photography about the Middle East and Western media, you know, which captures like the nuances of everyday life in the Middle East. So, like, this piece from Iran, beautiful pictures, you know, showing two women in a cafe. Street scene, a man and a woman next to a monument someone writing on a blackboard. It's just so touching that I was so inspired. <laughs> I was so inspired by that that... Uh, <laughs> I, I carefully recorded life in the West to convey it to my, my fellow people in the Middle East. And in this scene, we see a mother and child in a supermarket uh, where many Western people shop and uh, using trolleys. The workplace, you know, much like us, Westerners work in offices and other places of employment. <laughs> Sadly, they also have to attend meetings and pretend they are interested. <laughs> okay, you, you read it. <laughs> Just tell me when you're done. <laughs> and, and this one is really touching, I think. Uh, I think I was really close to them when I was taking this photograph. <laughs> But, but it's, it's, it's all good in the interest of anthropology. <laughs> okay, and uh, we're almost there. <laughs> w would you rather have 45 minutes for questions and answers or should I take three, four minutes extra to finish this? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the rules. So um, again, and this, just wasn't like this, this kind of things that I, what I was trying to do is merely I was trying to learn from Western methodology. So for example, this poll, with this poll which uh, asked people in several Arab and Muslim countries, how do they see, you know, what is appropriate for women, how is appropriate for women dress in public? And obviously it had to be on a scale uh, of uh, head, headgear. And, uh, and I thought um, in trying to explain Western culture to my Middle Eastern audience, I, uh, I developed this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ball of what style of dress is appropriate for American women to wear in public and um, try to imbue it with the same kind of subtle understanding of social complexities and fashion. And um, that went on for a long time. And then uh, 2016 came around. 2016 was great, I think, because uh, two seminal events happened that allowed me to kind of develop my uh, Wiener Studies program <laughs> in response to the accelerating effect events on the ground. And um, the first event was Brexit. And um, I, I was thinking very hard about Brexit, you know. <laughs> and 
and, and it really hurts me to see so much division in the country. You know? and, uh, the, the inability of Britain to resolve its uh, uh, problems through political mechanisms. And I was thinking for a long time, how, how could I help? How could I help? Um, do, do I organize like a concert in Beirut where we can... <laughs> Or a conflict resolution workshop where <laughs> we can get some remainers and some leavers and teach them about the values of unity <laughs> and coherence. Do, 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 we have, do we have to teach them, you know, send NGOs to teach them about bridge building initiatives? But then I thought, no, I'm approaching this all wrong. What would Britain have done in this situation? <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> partition, right? And <laughs> this is when I came up with the idea of Libya and Romania, and obviously they have to share a border when there's a Berlin wall-style divider that runs right through Trafalgar Square. <laughs> and I even volunteered to draw the map. <laughs> <laughs> Te textbook British uh, attitude. And then the second thing that happened in 2016 was obviously <laughs> Trump. And um, at this point, I was sort of uh, started to accelerate my um, coverage. Um, <laughs> And, and obviously, you know, to explain again to the Middle Eastern audience, because nobody talks about the United States in, in proper way, you know, the, what, what is happening over here? We had a, an outgoing president, president-elect, rural strongholds, extremist rebels. Um, <laughs> these are just some random symbols to fill the page. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the secretive state security agencies that I'm going to come back to uh, in a minute, Hmm. And um, obviously, I had to look at the foreign backers of the different <laughs> factions uh, within the United States. Um, clearly, Russia is a big one over there. Uh, I think I'm missing Saudi Arabia, but we're it's not too late. To and then, um, what, what really amazed me about the, the period after the election of Trump, I mean, aside from the phenomenon of Trump itself, is um, I, I realized that uh, Arabs and Americans have many things in common. Um, um, in, in particular, which led me to the writing of, of this piece. Um, <laughs> but in particular, in particular, uh, and um, it was the fondness with which American liberals kind of um, showed towards their uh, mukhabarat this <laughs> in, in the aftermath of the election of Trump. So um, uh, I kind of drew these parallels between the two situations, but what I really was doing again is kind of trying to reverse this uh, way of looking at the Middle East and, 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 and kind of trying to put it in the American context. And, um, you know, I was getting very stressed about what was happening uh, uh, with Europe. Before I get to that, I'm just kind of some of my reflections about that, that period and Trump's travel ban and all of that. Um, and then I was getting really stressed because, you know, we started to see headlines like, no, Europe isn't about to break up, but everybody was seeing there's lots of trouble in the West. There's talk about the, 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 the Western model failing and there's lots of tension. And obviously, you know, we had to look at the historical reasons for that was happening. Um, but it was a, it's a tense time. It continues to be a tense time. And, and then again, I was, um, I was thinking, what, what could I do to help? And I think I came up with, with the right answer for that, <laughs> <laughs> which is a new peaceful Western Europe, a map for a new peace, again inspired by what the West had done in the Middle East. And I think you can all agree that this map will guarantee peace and separate all this. You know, you see this discontent everywhere. You look at the French elections. Uh, it was roughly divided along those lines. You know about the tension within Spain. And I think, you know, it's high time 
we used the, the same tools that were used in the Middle East to resolve Europe's problems. And uh, look, I've, I've tried my best to solve <laughs> the West's problems by, by following its, uh, its path. But um, I'm, a, I'm a bit optimistic, so maybe, just maybe, Okay, thank you so much for this uh, really, you know, fun talk, but also very informative. And I think for people like uh, like me who work in academia, but who also used to be a journalist, it's kind of interesting to see uh, the the ways in which things are presented and misrepresented, and they continue to be that way. So there are a few things that we can ask questions about. Um, without further ado, may I may. Who, whoever wants to put uh, to ask a question, can you put your hand up? And we need to get a microphone to you. And please make uh, keep your question short and precise and to the point. All right, this gentleman here in the front. I enjoyed your your the section on the Western journalists. If I think about why Western journalists are so focused on the Middle East and say not flying off to South America or not filling the, the headlines with it, you've gone a long way and you haven't turned your sarcasm onto oil, which is surely the only reason. Why oil? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to answer them one by one or maybe take a bunch? Um, maybe we'll take a bunch, yes. Yes, please, here. Well, it's a very amusing talk, you see. I think uh, uh, looking at the state of Arab world, you see, by old men when I was very young, uh, said that uh, the colonization of Palestine will be the change of Middle East and it will create hell of a lot of problem and it will go on for a long time and what can we can see now what is happening between Trump, Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, intention to attack uh, Iran which shows how Gulliver, the people are. Okay, uh, and the third question. Uh, we have a question submitted on Twitter by Ibrahim Halawi, who says you've gutted to have missed your talk and wanted to get your expert opinion on what happened after Hariri and Bin Talal walked into Ritz Bar. <laughs> 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 okay, do you want to take these? Yeah, take questions or do you want uh, more? Maybe take some more. <laughs> yeah, take some more questions. Yes, one at the back there. Uh, there in, in the middle, yes, with the... Oh, and at the top, there's one there. Uh, uh, just, uh, just wait for this one. M my question is regarding the, the uses of, of satire and how, how you can use it to affect change. Uh, I'm, I'm half American, uh, half Austrian, and recently in Austria we passed this ridiculous law that bans um, religious uh, Muslim women from uh, dressing how they would like to, but it's still legal to dress up as the devil on St. Christopher's Day and go around and scare people. Um, and I pointed this out to some Austrians that for a pious Catholic country, you could, it was legal to dress up as the devil, but you couldn't express your religion as a woman how you wanted to. And most of them, perhaps it has to do with the Austrian lack of humor, but most of them were ashamed <laughs> uh, rather than found this funny. The, the satire didn't e exactly translate. So I was wondering, um, I, first, I, I don't speak Arabic, and, and I'm not f that familiar with the region. So how well does satire translate across languages in, in your experience? And secondly, is satire more effective than shaming, or are they sometimes the same thing? And the last question there, and then. First, thank you for your talk. But I want to know your perspective. How has the West's perception of the Middle East changed in the past 10 years? So has it got better? Has it got worse? Okay, I, I think I'm going to start with the last one because, I mean, obviously for um, satirical reasons, it's very convenient for me to pretend that the West is a monolithic block and, uh, um, you know, and to mock you know, everyone in the West. And, and obviously reality is much more complex uh, than that. Um, but I think there's a lot of engagement with the Middle East, particularly from... Um, 
Arab uprisings in 2011 on, I think, which is, was, I guess, an inspiring moment uh, for a period of time that got a lot of people interested in the region, um, which was a positive thing. A lot of people wanted to learn more about the region, and um, I gained many Twitter followers because of that. <laughs> But I, but I guess where I got stuck on um, how this relationship is portrayed is not so much the, the Orientalism and the cliches and all of that. It's rather that even sometimes with people who kind of are fond of the Middle East, there's a sense of not regarding it on equal footing. And it can manifest itself in uh, saviorism sometimes to the extent that you feel that the voices of uh, Arabs or people in the Middle East sometimes get lost amongst the voices of the saviors. So it's quite a complicated phenomenon. And I'm personally, you know, I came to this before satire. I used to write uh, serious political analysis. Is I came to it from a quite a strong pro-sovereignty um, and um, autonomy and um, self-determination angle. And it always bothered me that a lot of people kind of tried to build um, political momentum on the back of getting Westerners interested in their case and, and kind of translating some political categories into more humanitarian categories. And that always can backfire. So it's a very long way to say it's quite a complex situation. There's, I think, a lot much more, like you go back 10 years even, there used to be the kind of the few people who, you know, understood the Middle East and translated it to a Western audience. But you get much more nuanced and uh, specialized uh, academic uh, and journalistic understanding, I think, of the region today. But the complexity comes from this inability to look at the Middle East on equal footing and kind of to recognize uh, aspects like autonomy and self-determination and, and, and kind of allow the people to speak for themselves, uh, so to speak. So that's one. Now, um, uh, on the use of um, satire in the, um, the Austrian case, I guess, that question, how does satire translate? Um, so I have two Twitter accounts. I'm going to answer it this way. One, one is in English and one is in Arabic. And I don't, I don't know why I ever did that. But I end up there. And, and um, at one point, I was like writing things in English and then choosing the very best tweets and then translating them into Arabic. And then they would all bomb in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically, you realize, like, um, I don't know if it's just between Arabic and English or other languages. It's, it's, uh, it's a fundamentally different conception of how you do uh, satire. Um, although, when you look at what's been happening now with memes and the kind of, you know, social media creates a kind of a universal uh, field where I started to see the influence. There's almost like a new universal language emerging. This kind of flattens those uh, regional things. But I still think actually the most clever forms of satires are the ones that are most kind of locally based in a way and more kind of attuned to the cultural specificity and the way to express uh, you know, what's special at that culture. So um, that's why I would never be able to satirize that in, in Austria, uh, for example. Uh, I can't think of a punchline for uh, the Hariri question yet. Sorry. <laughs> You're all staring at me. Maybe if you just <laughs> <laughs> But I'll do it before the end of the session. But. Um, Sorry, on the oil question, I had a video about that, but I had to cut it out. That's the easy answer. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Oh, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, it was a comment, not more of a question about the point about the of, uh, colonization of Palestine, but I think it's useful as an entry to say, um, which, which I kind of talked a lot about, alluded to in terms of, you know, the relationships in the Middle East, how the, the borders were drawn historically, although that's not kind of a straightforward um, bad thing, let's say, the, the nation states that we have today, I don't think they're necessarily a bad thing. They're actually a very good alternative to the very reactionary medieval forms of politics that will come and fill their places today. Um, but Palestine is one example of this kind of um, external Western scheming and meddling, and which which 
created a lot of problems in the Middle East across the region, but it will continue to do so because you still see this alive and kicking today, this kind of need for, I showed a lot of the articles where someone can say, I mean, how can you sit down and say, you know, you're, you're a foreign observer and let's partition Iraq. Who are you? Who gave you the authority to partition Iraq? It's not your job. This is for Iraqis to, to do it. And just because it feels difficult to you, maybe it's not your job. Just walk away from it. Yeah. Okay, next round of questions. I think there's one there and one there, one here. Um. Al Hamez, yes, and Anthony Oxford and SOAS. Thanks very much for a wonderful and entertaining presentation. Um, a comment, if I may, uh, and then we'll move on to a question. The, the comment is much of what you've shown today uh, with regards to the media coverage is actually also very relevant within the economic policy space, particularly in North Africa and the Gulf, places where I, I, I work. Uh, and while you mentioned savorism, and I, and I agree with that, that point, maybe one can also think about how some of these countries and policymakers in these countries also suffer from what one can describe as an inferiority complex, mm -hmm. which then plays into that. Um, but my two very quick questions. The first serious one is, um, how have the sort of thinking or thought process of uh, Bernard Lewis on the one side and Edward Said on the other uh, informed some of your, 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 your work? Um, and uh, there was another question in there, but I can't, oh sorry, yeah. A sort of more, a, a funnier question if you like. Um, who, who do you think from all the leaders that we've seen in recent years in the Middle East, has the most sort of humor value, <laughs> or if you like, from a sort of <laughs> cultification process, and, and Qaddafi, Qaddafi doesn't count, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, one uh, here, right? <coughs> yeah, there's here, and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Um, so, um, usually in Syria, whenever, like, after, especially after the revolution, uh, satire was, at the beginning, very welcomed, uh, depending, like, on which political side you are. But then, um, as like other uh, satires, when they were attacking uh, their own, not attacking, but when they were like, let's say... Criticizing. Uh, criticizing, mm. yes. Uh, um, their own, let's say, political stand, mm. they've been like themselves attacked of being like offensive. Mm. And this has pushed back a lot of satire um, writers in, uh, in Syria especially. Mm -hmm, mm. So I want to know your point of view on that. And how do you deal with those like attackers that uh, usually like if you're writing I with them then you're nice and good if yeah. you're not then you're bad you're the bad guy so yeah. how does that thank you and there's one there yeah uh, thanks a lot for your uh, talk uh, we've all enjoyed it a lot of course but I have a question about your style of humor so do you sometimes feel that your occidentalist style may 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 get kind of old do you do you, do you sometimes have that feeling that this occidentalism is kind of reaching its you know, satirical values end, essentially. <laughs> Any other questions for this round? Yes. Uh, there's one here at the front. Is there anyone from the top? Yeah, okay. Uh, in the front. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think uh, we Arabs should be helping the poor Americans with their <laughs> autocratic leader? <laughs> uh, start a coup or a civil war or what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, that's good, yeah. Uh, and uh, yes, up there. Me? Are you also the person behind the fake Joseph Massad review of the gay bar Bardo in Beirut? Sorry, can you repeat? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Thanks. I, I think it's a, um, I think the person is known, no? I, I think they are. I've, I've only written one piece about Massad, but it's not that one. It's Mine is called The Empire of Cheese. Oh yeah, that one yeah. I know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah. Oh, there's one there. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I attended a conference last week in Oxford and uh, speaking about being ready for democracy, uh, Abdullah Dardari um, was giving a presentation and when I asked him the reason why he wasn't advocating for political change when he was in, government, in the government, he basically said that he strongly believed that his people were not ready for democracy. Mm. So what do you do in such cases? Like, where do you situate this kind of elite? Okay, thank you. Okay, Carl, shall we? Yeah. Yeah, quite a. 
Let's start with the last one, I guess, because that's the problem is from the very beginning, I think it's, um, there's a risk in doing this uh, uh, kind of occidentalist stuff or kind of trying to rebut Orientalism and all of that. That's sort of, we kind of try to portray everyone in the Arab world as heroic and great and all of that, which is not absolutely not true because I think we've, we've seen the failure of our elites uh, in the past few years in, in the Arab world in a, in a, in a, in a very big way, uh, especially you know, liberal elites, the so-called secular elites in terms of their lack of commitment to democracy and the genuine democracy. You know, I think um, you see what happened in Egypt, for example, a lot of people are willing to go with repression just to avoid Islamists in, in power. I think um, that, that was, Quite a quite a big setback, and it's an intellectual setback. It's a moral setback. It's a political setback. And I myself, you know, I'm I consider myself to be a radical secular atheist. I'm not a fan of Islamism at all. But I think that was one of the moments of um, where, if you really wanted democracy, you have to ride it out. Um, I think Americans and Brits actually need to hear that today. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, what I'm trying to say is this kind of uh, notion that uh, we're not ready for democracy is infiltrated, you know. The elites always kind of voice that. And you start to see these articles where like um, Egyptian liberals sometimes and should uh, uneducated people be given the right to vote, you know. As if it's like, oh, so co I'm so cool, I'm so contrarian. And, and, and it's, it's stupid, you know, you can't even, you can't ask those questions if you have any legit, you know, fundamental belief in, in, in democracy. So I think we, we, we have problems. And uh, um, there's a lot of kind of faith in this dependency on the West and trying to kind of restore the balance that I've tried to kind of argue against for a long time, and, and but the problem is, and I'm completely hijacking your question to say what I want to say, is <laughs> that, that, that the centers of intellectual thought, with all respect to the LSE and so on, are not in the Arab world today, you know. Most Arab youth you talk to, what they read and where they learn and all of that is coming from the West, even if it pretends to be radical, and that's completely skewed position and it, we cannot sustain it like that without uh, authentic localized uh, centers of knowledge or in the production of knowledge in the Arab world and that's what's truly missing uh, today and without that we're going to be in this relationship of dependency where we, you know we're waiting for some training to enlighten us as opposed to actually taking big leaps big radical uh, uh, leaps um, so that's that one. I want to go back to the Syrian one because I think the Syrian scene was one of the most, uh, um, in a very dark way, m most powerful um, scenes of satire, uh, along with Egypt as well. There was some, but I think in Syria because it got much, much kind of bleaker and much darker. Um, there was some really good satire uh, being made. And um, unfortunately, I think if you look with, and ties back to my other point, if you look at the 60s and the 70s period of um, political activism and radicalism and modernity and across the Arab world, there was much more uh, commitment to the values of free expression and free speech. And um, this has been completely diluted and it's been diluted again because we're being kind of, we're importing all those Western notions and a lot of kind of levels, they, 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 they kind of try to portray Arabs and Muslims as somehow infantile and unable to deal with criticism and offensive speech and things like that. And we kind of start to internalize them. So that's why when you use the word offensive, it was quite important because I think, yeah, well, I mean, what's offensive to one person is not necessarily offensive to another, but you're talking in the context of a major social and political upheaval. Whatever someone is going to say is going to offend someone. Um, and, and, I, and I think, um, unfortunately, I feel we've, we've lost the ability to do that, but we should regain it. And it did impact on a lot of voices in, uh, in Syria. So. Uh, one, one of my favorite kind of, he used to do kind of satirical podcast, Tanjar um, al He tried to kind of navigate um, nonpartisan, but not necessarily not morally committed, like a morally committed number. It wasn't pa partisan. And 
uh, he got excluded completely from the scene and people wouldn't uh, listen to his uh, work anymore. And I think we lose, we lose something in that because in those great periods of social and political agitation is when we most need uh, radical voices. But radical voices, they have to be able to say whatever they want because otherwise we're gonna always be stuck within the parameters of the politeness of uh, daily life within our societies. Uh, now, on the question of, yes, Occidentalist, where was the question? Occidental humor, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm, it's like, it's, it's, this was like, that's it. This, this, I'm burying it tonight. I'm, I'm moving on. Uh, you know, I think it's always up to context as well and how you use it and, and how do you deploy it. And I think a lot of people now, it's just become a knee-jerk reflex. That's why I was like, I don't do it on Twitter anymore because for some people, the first thing they would do, I swear to God, you can just replace them with a the bot is they would just kind of flip it automatically and then do you know a Western piece of news and put, put it in a in an in Arab context and I guess at the end of the day it just depends on how well you do it. I'm not claiming I do it well, but <laughs> um, now the question about Bernard Lewis and Edward Said. I certainly wasn't influenced by Bernard Lewis. I'm curious why you <laughs> think I was. <laughs> I'm influenced by Edward Said, but uh, um, I'm influenced by he, the humanist Edward Said, who is, Edward Said was a humanist. I don't know why he's being stripped of that attribute today. There's, there's a way of like the reproduction of a different Edward Said in the guise of a, um, a leader of national Arab identity. I mean, it's, it's kind of completely at odds with what his work represented and uh, I think to me the subtlety and the nuance with which he uh, analyzed this Western conception of uh, the Middle East or the East in general was absolutely brilliant, but it's getting, I think, it's seriously getting debased today and being uh, abused to kind of con construct a very defensive sense of identity that's completely the opposite of what he said. I'll leave it there. Did I miss anything? No, I think you've done all. Can, can we have a, a, sorry? Yeah, I'm still working. Oh, yes, yes, to those questions. Oh, yeah. Um, see, you know, that, that was a, it's a real disappointment now, you know, with like, um, after Saddam and, and Gaddafi and all of that, there's nobody inspiring uh, on this scene. <laughs> and... Um, and, and you, you know, I don't say this flippantly, right? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm from all over uh, the Middle East. So uh, my father is from Lebanon, my mother is from Iraq. I've got relatives in um, Turkey, Jordan, Palestine, Syria, e everywhere, basically. And uh, one of the greatest things about growing up in Iraq, and I lived for a long period of time in Iraq, is the great Iraqi sense of humor, which was like those amazing subversive jokes about Saddam Hussein at the time. Uh, were absolutely fantastic, and uh, I think the personalities, in a way, kind of uh, mm. lend themselves to that, in a way. And uh, I realized that when uh, Sisi came to power, and uh, aside from all everything that's bad about him, he's got no comic potential at all. It's <laughs> 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 very frustrating. I'm still working on the bar joke. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Uh, can you wait for the microphone because we need to... I was actually surprised by your comment that when you translated your sarcasm, it flopped. Because um, the Middle East has a long history of sarcasm. Mm. I mean, Adab and Nawadir started it Sorry. from the, I don't know, Umayyad times. And mm. the, the political jokes were amazing. They, they took the piss out of yeah. the caliphs and the clergy and everyone. Mm. So why d aren't they funny? I mean, yeah. they, they should be. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to get back to you. By the way, if you're leaving now, you're going to miss the ice cream. I was going to give ice cream. And <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. Sorry, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, but I just did. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to take that one now while we're uh, going for, uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, because uh, I think it's important before I forget what I wanted to say about it, because I'm going old and senile, uh, is um, I, I only meant that it's a completely different way of constructing uh, satire and, and, and jokes between English and Arabic. So when I translated them like literally word for word, they don't work in Arabic. 
So the only jokes that work in Arabic are the ones that start, you know, I, start, I have to start thinking about it in Arabic, and then it comes out completely, completely different, and then it would work. But seriously, if you just take the same English joke and then try to kind of phrase it in Arabic, it would just, absolutely. And then I had a big problem with that because I was trying, um, I was trying to kind of write blog posts in Arabic, satirical blog posts in Arabic as well. And I wrote about six and then I gave up. <laughs> Because, uh, did okay. yeah, 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 this, this, that's why I'm saying it's a completely different skill. Because for me, Arabic is not a language for satire. Like, when I want to start writing in Arabic and start thinking on satire, I, satire is not the first thing that comes to mind when I start with Arabic, you know. If I start thinking in Arabic, I start, you know, uh, lamenting the loss of Andalusia. <laughs> <laughs> We have we have at least at least seven people who want to ask questions. Okay. Can I please ask ask you to keep your questions very short and to the point? So we start here. Yes, uh, Carl. Thank you. I really uh, enjoyed your talk. I found it very insightful, and I, I speak as a former Middle East correspondent, uh, <laughs> working uh, f many years for the BBC World Service and then for the Economist. I see the Economist got a little comment, but not the World Service, but. Um, but I do have a serious question, that, that is, um, do you think that Western uh, journalists misunderstand the Middle East more than they misunderstand other parts of the world? A and if so, why? Okay. Um, can I take one here and one here quickly? Thank you so much for your lecture. Um, I'm wondering, are there uh, people from the region that inspire you? I'm thinking of uh, Shabakat al-Hudud that's writing out of Amman that has very little popularity, <laughs> sadly, and then Elias Khouri, who uses video blogs as a way to deliver his message, which do you think there are more effective mediums than others? And please share some of your inspirations, if you could. And one there, and then I have two. I have one, two there. Okay, up there, just, just one second, yeah. Um, as a satirist, um, what are your thoughts on the representation of Muhammad in Charlie Hebdo? The of representation of? Of Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad in Charlie Hebdo. Um, you mentioned Egypt earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an Egyptian, I feel like we're faced with a dilemma where people are pulled between like Islamic democracy and secular authoritarianism. So as a believer of secularism, do you not think that a secular transition period of authoritarianism is like essential for an effective democracy? Okay. A uh, quick question there, and then I have to come down here, and we probably cannot take any more questions, yeah? Uh, thank you. I'm going to have uh -huh. two little questions, and one of them is that when you say maybe the West isn't ready for democracy yet, does it mean that democracy wasn't a good choice in the first place, or it's sort of like a leveling down argument that we're bad, but you're bad too kind of thing? And the second question is, I see you use Turkey in some like some categories in Middle East and some categories not. As a Turkish, obviously, uh, it just struck my attention. And I was just curious, why did you? Or what do you think about it in general? I'll have to take this one before you, yeah? Right. First of all, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I wish all the questions were like that. <laughs> I was going to ask what you think about uh, the Turkish President Erdogan and his general stance that is perceived by the West to be anti-West. And one there, and that's, I think I'll have to stop the questions because you have a lot. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, we have five minutes. I don't know if I'm going to remember uh, them all. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the West uses democracy as a sort of moral high ground for pretty much everything they do. Um, so my question is, but you don't see the West trying to save Singapore, which is a benevolent dictatorship. So my question is, do we, it, is democracy really needed in the Middle East? Is there a better way to go? Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we can spend a century talking about it. <laughs> so let me just start from the beginning. I'm a big believer in democracy, just to clarify that aspect. And... Um, I believe we have to ride out democracy with its worst and its best. And that's why, you know, when I was talking, I kind of rushed it a little bit. My reactions to what happened with Trump and Brexit and all of that, 
is I discovered that we used to think that was, and sorry again to Egyptians, I'm not singling you out, it's just that um, you're the biggest Arab country, so we have to talk to you about a lot. And thank you for Mohammed Salah, by the way, who's the most brilliant striker in, in the Premier League. <laughs> Um, and, um, and, 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 and that kind of places a responsibility on you to set a, uh, a, a precedent uh, in a way. But we used to think that what happened after, the, after and around the coup in Egypt was uh, we kind of like, you know, oh, Egyptian liberals. But then I looked at American and British liberals and centrists or whatever, and I think they have as little faith in democracy as... Um, Egyptian liberals were supposed to have had at the time, you know, it's uh, when when things don't go your way and uh, you're just willing to kind of go completely against every democratic principle, that then, in my opinion, that's not necessarily a good thing. So I will always stand up for democracy, but democracy as a, um, a, a kind of, in a, and as a, a form of self-expression of um, the will of the people, self-determination, and all of these things in the context of the Middle East, if you try to import them and enforce them by external invasions or whatever, it's not going to work because they can't, it can't be handed to you. And um, it's gonna take some time, but I'm very optimistic that we need to develop this kind of autonomous sense of uh, democracy, but we have to really give it a chance and Again, I would never vote for an Islamist party. I'm completely opposed to Islamist party. I've been in fights with Islamist parties in the AUB because we, you know, they're different things. <laughs> and if they won the elections, it's the right to fair and square to govern. And that's, you know, you can see multiple examples of that's happening. So I think we, we need to kind of say, there's gonna be a transitional point where we have to put our faith in democracy and then if the system really works, then that's what's gonna show it. Every time we say there's a state of emergency and we backtrack on it, then it's a major uh, setback. Now, this takes me to the point about do you think Western journalists misunderstand the Middle East more than any other regions? I used to think so. But then, during the uh, American election, the campaign, I was listening to the BBC, the World Service, one day, and there was this uh, BBC correspondent, the World Service, in Alabama or somewhere like that, and he was talking to this uh, man over there who was a Trump some supporter, and I, and I was listening, and I thought, he's speaking to this man with the same patronizing tone that's normally reserved for people in the Middle East. <laughs> and at first, it confused me. But then I realized, actually, the flood of kind of explainers and articles, and it, it's kind of, it's not so much about the Middle East. I think there's a lot of maybe, you know, class dimensions and other kind of dividers where um, you hear it about um, people here from the north of England, for example, talked about in those terms now. You hear it about Americans. You hear it all across the board. And I think... Uh, we're, I mean, you know, it's my circles, I'm, I'm, I'm liberal, I'm uh, cosmopolitan, I'm all of that, but, but we're a bit smug, let's admit it, from me. <laughs> I'm starting with myself, and that smugness, I, I think, kind of reflects itself in this patronizing uh, tone that I was talking about. But, but on a serious note, I genuinely, from 2016 onwards, I started to hear that uh, more commonly, not only about the Middle East, but it was almost like this moment of great Western introspection, having, you know, like finished World War II, and then we've done, we've answered all the big questions. We don't need to think about this. Berlin Wall falls, we're triumphant. We don't need to do self-introspection. And then 2016 happens, and whoa, let's do some introspection. <laughs> so that was that. Uh, I'm, I'm not influenced by anyone in the region, I don't know who asked me the question about, uh, but they are my friends, Al Hudud, they're, they're doing great work. Um, Turkey. Um, so my feeling about Erdogan is, I'm gonna tell a story. Um, Erdogan once said this thing, which is a great saying, I love it. He said, um, why drink wine if you can eat the grapes? <laughs> To which I replied, 
Why eat a kebab if you can bite the sheep? <laughs> and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, there's lots of complex. I'm not going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, Turkey is a member of NATO, you know, and and and. Um, I think the kind of the deployment of this anti-Western narrative is quite cynical when you're a member of NATO. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> um, and finally, I'm, I'm not going to run away from that question about Charlie Hebdo, um, but I'm going to put it in its context. And, and that context is, if you know the, the Middle East very well, and I talk about the experience the countries that I lived the most on in is uh, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. You know that blaspheming is a very recurrent thing in everyday life. And, and I think it's in a way, um, that form of blasphemy is almost like a form of intimacy with God. It's like because we feel we're very close to him because he comes from the region. <laughs> We can be on very familiar <laughs> basis <laughs> with him. Um, so it kind of feeds into my belief in uh, you know, the freedom of speech. And I guess it's all about um, context and how you approach it. But again, I think uh, once we start making exceptions, um, it, it, it doesn't end well uh, normally. Um, so so I, I, I kind of, some people think that I'm an absol absolutist and I understand there's unequal power dynamics, but I think the way to correcting those unequal power dynamics is not being deprived of your right to free speech and uh, free expression and a free press and all of these things because they come together as a package. I've seen this very clearly in terms of how um, European and Western hate laws are being used, particularly European hate laws, are being used to suppress dissent, for example, from groups uh, that support BDS. But once you give the moral cover to laws that curb free speech and free expression, it most likely it will be used against you. Did I miss anything? I don't know. That's it. I will have, I apologize for those people who had uh, questions, but we don't have time because we have to close at eight. Um, but I think we have heard a fascinating talk. Um, it's not only about making fun and about using satire to make jokes and so on, but it's about how satire can make us look at things in different ways and also look at things um, that might irritate us, but also tell us something about ourselves as well. And I think that is uh, it's very interesting to have such a variety of people in, in the audience, you know, sort of, um, and, and I'm sure many of you are, well, we have the journalists and we have, um, you know, pe people who, who are um, doing their degrees and learning and, you know, we, we all think of ourselves as knowing so much about everything. Um, but I think that uh, one of the most interesting aspects of the talk is the way that um, Carl has been able to bring about a, a kind of a common language, I would say, um, or try and use a common language to, to think about issues that matter to each and every one of us. So it's not only about the Middle East, it's about ev everything else. So with this, I want to thank Carl for uh, this thought-provoking and kind of, uh, you know, great fun evening. I've, I haven't experienced such great fun for such a long time. Thank so you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.